Hi everybody. Eight years ago on the 28th of September 2015, we lost the director, John Gilliman. He died at the age of 89. He'd been retired from directing since the late 80s and his career in the 80s ended with somewhat of a whimper. Unfortunately, when he died in 2015, there was some obituaries that were written about him. But for instance, when the Oscars went to do their uh, typical um, recognition of actors and directors and filmmakers who have passed away during the previous year, there was no mention of John Gilliman. Now, his widow, Mary Gilliman, was able to put together this wonderful book, John Gilliman, The Man, The Myth, The Movies, in an effort to rectify that situation and gain more awareness of John's work. Many people will perhaps associate John Gilliman most closely with the films from the 70s, which are King Kong and The Towering Inferno, two big box office hits from that decade. But both of those films are really overshadowed by larger-than-life producers, those being Erwin Allen and Dino De Laurentiis. So it's really worthwhile to look at the whole career of John Gilliman to see what he achieved. He was a volatile director, known for his temperament uh, and not easy to get along with. But there's few directors that have worked with such a range of actors as John Gilliman. Because he started his career in the UK and then went on to Hollywood, he's worked with everybody. In the UK, it can be actors such as Sid James and Thora Heard, Prunella Scales, Margaret Rutherford, John Gregson. And then when he went to Hollywood, it literally was, well, not quite an A to Z. I couldn't find a Z person, but certainly an A to W with everybody from Fred Astaire to Orson Welles. So yes, John Gilliman was a tough director, but he's worked with them all. He's worked in all different types of genres, uh, starting off with making films in the UK, which were comedies and dramas and romance, a children's film foundation film. Um, and then he's also made westerns. He's made disaster movies, war movies um, and thrillers. Actresses Mia Farrow and Jessica Lange got their film debuts in John Gilliman films, as did Simi Garowal, who has since become uh, a TV show host and public figure in India. And when it comes to iconic characters in cinema and popular culture, well, John Gilliman's been involved with those too. Uh, so, for example, Tarzan, John Shaft, Hercule Poirot, King Kong, and, well, yes, Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. So let's now just take a look at what I have in my film collection. I have quite an extensive collection of John Gilliman films. Not complete, because there are some which are a little bit hard to find. Um, but I think it's probably more than you'll see on any other uh, YouTube channel currently. So let's go. First up, we have this one, Torment, from 1950, uh, which was actually written and directed by John Gilliman. It's also known by the title Paper Gallows. Uh, in this one, we have two brothers who are crime novelists, and they have a live-in secretary. One of the brothers has more success with the, with the secretary than the other, and the other brother is a little bit more psychotic, and he actually commits a murder because he wants to actually know what it feels like so that he can write uh, a best-selling novel about a murder mystery. And he tries to pin the murder on his secretary. Really unusual little plot, this one. It's not entirely successful script-wise, but there's some taut direction here from John Gilliman in an early film from him and some suspenseful use of music. The Whole Truth from 1958 is a neat little thriller uh, that stars Stuart Granger and George Sanders and Donna Reed. Um, Stuart Granger plays a movie producer in this who's having an affair with his leading lady. Um, and when a murder happens, well, we get George Sanders as a detective uh, coming to investigate. Yeah, quite a neat little thriller, this one. Not perfect by any means, but still quite good. The Crowded Day from 1954 is a film that I particularly enjoy from John Gilliman, and I think this really shows his directorial skills coming to the fore. Um, it's all set within a UK department store, a busy London department store, and it all concerns that mainly the lives of all the women that work there. And he has a really sensitive handling of all of their uh, various concerns and interactions, particularly when it comes to uh, actress Josephine Griffin, who's playing a character... Uh, who has um, a pregnancy and her 
partner is absent, she's facing dismissal at work um, and has suicidal tendencies as well. Uh, and yeah, so the way that some of those scenes are handled is really uh, taut and uh, suspenseful and dramatic. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on in the crowded day. Uh, there's some humour in here as well. It also stars John Gregson and fresh from being in Genevieve uh, so he has a, a big car in this as well but uh, yeah this is mainly about the women really good film The Crowded Day uh, this particular BFI edition also includes another John Gilliman film here, Song in Paris, um, which was not actually filmed in Paris because of the budget. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a, a little romantic comedy, uh, nothing too special to be honest, uh, but it stars Dennis Price and Anne Vernon. Thunderstorm is well worth seeking out if you can find it. This is from 1956. Um, and yeah, this involves a woman who's washed up on a Spanish coastal town, a fishing town, um, and she has siren-like qualities and starts uh, really causing all the men in the fishing village to tear themselves apart. Um, yeah, interesting one, this. Um, definitely some of the filming in this shows some sort of neo-realism qualities, uh, particularly when we're getting to see the lives of the fishermen and uh, the fishing town uh, before this woman appears. Now, the woman herself is played by Linda Christian, and she's uh, credited as being the first Bond girl. Well, you'll have to kind of search quite a bit to be able to find it. But yes, she was in a TV episode of Casino Royale back in the 50s. Um, now, she was actually um, involved with Tyrone Power uh, around this time as well. And uh, interestingly, there's a scene here which is kind of reminiscent from um, the uh, kissing scene on the beach uh, of From Here to Eternity. And it actually transpires that um, Tyrone Power and Lindia Christian were actually actually offered roles in that film but uh, declined it. Um, this film is also the only film that was produced by British actress Binnie Barnes. Town on Trial from 1957 is a neat little British film noir that stars John Mills and Charles Coburn uh, and it includes quite a tense little climax that's on top of a church uh, as John Mills has to climb it to uh, see if he can get uh, hold of the murderer. Um, now, this indicator um, edition of the film, Town on Trial, also includes the Children's Film Foundation film uh, that John Gilliman made, which was called Adventures in the Hot Fields. Um, and that's a really interesting little one as well, uh, which stars Mandy Miller, the little girl who uh, was famous for singing Nelly the Elephant. Nelly the Elephant packed her trunk, said goodbye to the circus. Um, but yeah, and she was also starred in the Hammer film, The Snorkel. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a, a neat little uh, children's film about a girl who breaks an ornament uh, at her parents' home and then dashes off to uh, the Kent countryside to do some hot picking to see if she can uh, get the money to uh, pay for a new ornament for her parents. Uh, but yeah, the cast in that one includes Melvin Hayes, and it's an early example of John Gilliman using his fire commanding skills, which he'd later go on to use in The Towering Inferno, because there's quite an intense fire sequence uh, in a windmill uh, in Adventures in the Hot Fields. But yeah, Town on Trial, definitely an interesting little film noir thriller uh, that stars John Mills. I Was Monty's Double is a really fascinating film that really has some historical interest. Now, this is a World War II drama that's based on actual events, uh, and it concerns an actor who was hired to impersonate General Montgomery and to create a diversion by going on a tour to North Africa and divert uh, attention away from the actual activities of General Montgomery. Um, and the really fascinating thing about this film is that the actor who actually did that, Emmy Clifton James, is here in this movie recreating what he actually did. Now, the film gives it a bit more dramatic license and a bit more of a thriller element. But uh, yeah, that's the fascinating thing. Emmy Clifton James is not an actual uh, screen actor, but here he is trying to recreate what he actually did. Now, really, no one else has done that in movies apart from, I think, uh, Clint Eastwood doing the 1517 to Paris just a few years ago. So yeah, as a piece of history, I think this film is really significant uh, in terms of having true events being reenacted by the actual person that was involved. 
the day they robbed the Bank of England from 1959. Wow, this is an interesting one too. It's a crime caper that involves a group of men who want to go into the London sewers and burrow underneath the Bank of England and uh, then gain access and rob it. Um, now, great cast here that includes Aldo Ray, and we have a very early performance from Peter O'Toole. And the really significant thing about this film is that when this film was released, a certain David Lean went to the movies to see it, and he spotted Peter O'Toole in this film. And from there, we have our Lawrence of Arabia. In 1959, John Gilliman really reinvigorated the Tarzan franchise by directing Tarzan's Greatest Adventure uh, with Gordon Scott. Now, Gordon Scott had already been in some Tarzan movies, but this one was different. He was given much more dialogue as a character, uh, so he's not just grunting his way through things. But uh, yeah, so this became a really adventuresome thriller for Tarzan. Um, great use of locations in this and a terrific supporting cast that includes Anthony Quayle and a certain Sean Connery not long before he got the calling card to be in James Bond. John Gilliman's handling of Tarzan's Greatest Adventure meant that he was called back for another Tarzan movie, and that was Tarzan Goes to India, this time with Jock Mahoney in the role of Tarzan. And this one, again, has some great use of locations in India, and it involves Tarzan doing a, a perilous journey to try and save elephants from being rescued as a dam is about to be built. And this is the film that introduced Simi Garawal, um, so a young actress at that time. She has been in a a film that I really like later on in her career called The Burning Train, uh, but nowadays uh, she's a popular figure on Indian TV. Never Let Go from 1960 is a terrific little drama that involves Richard Todd, who normally plays heroic characters, but here playing a meek salesman who has his car stolen and he must try and find the courage to go up against a ruthless gang boss. And again, in a bit of a role reversal, that gang boss is played by Peter Sellers, and it's a really mean and vicious part for him. Quite a rare role for Peter Sellers here. Um, this film was also one of the very early film score roles for John Barry. And John Gilliman reunited with Peter Sellers for this one, Waltz of the Toreadors. Uh, this is a much different film. It's uh, adapted from a play by Jean Ennui, and it's a sort of farcical comedy. Uh, it sees Peter Sellers as a retired general who wants to consummate an affair with a woman that he met some 17 years ago, uh, and he has an ill wife at home. Now, Danny Robin is the uh, woman of his affection, and uh, she's a French starlet uh, who had success uh, in Alfred Hitchcock's Topaz um, and the wife of Peter Sellers in this film is played by Margaret Layton um, who uh, had an Oscar nominated role in Joseph Losey's The Go-Between um, so yeah the farcical comedy in this film doesn't work very well uh, but it has great use of locations uh, that include Leeds Castle and Bayham Abbey and Wakehurst Place um, and uh, there's a really intense dramatic scene which is quite unexpected uh, that involves Peter Sellers and Margaret Layton so it's worth watching just for that. In 1964, John Gilliman directed this tremendous war film, Guns at Batazi. Uh, now, perhaps if you listen to uh, the Empire Film podcast, you can go back and find one where he had Edgar Wright and uh, Quentin Tarantino uh, as guests on one episode. And in that episode, uh, Martin Scorsese had sent them both a list of British movies that they should watch, uh, and they ended up both raving about Guns at Batazi. It was a real discovery for them. Tarantino uh, had said that he was really not so keen on Richard Attenborough as an actor, but that all changed when he watched Guns at Batazi. So in Guns at Batazi, we have Richard Attenborough as a very stiff, upper-lipped, pompous colonel uh, who um, very regimented with his soldiers at uh, the camp that they are all at, um, and he's ridiculed by everyone uh, that uh, is in his command uh, but that all changes when they come under attack and Richard Attenborough's leadership skills suddenly really come to the fore. This is a terrific film gloriously filmed in widescreen by Douglas Slocum uh, who has worked on the Indiana Jones movies but yeah great role for Richard Attenborough uh, Guns at Batazi. 
Now, in 1965, we come to the film which John Gilliman himself considered to be the best film that he ever made, and it's Rapture. And wow, I would say that this film is indeed a masterpiece. Um, this is such an unusual production. It was filmed with a French crew in France. It stars Patricia Gotzi, Dean Stockwell and Melvin Douglas. Um, and it concerns a really vulnerable girl here who lives with an intense, stern father um, and who is perhaps... Uh, got some mental instability um, but she gets involved with a runaway criminal played by Dean Stockwell and um, has moments of sexual awakening with him. Now this film really touches on some delicate issues here but it does it so sensitively and so well um, the crew here that's involved in this is really fascinating uh, one of the writers that was involved is Ennio Flaiano now he has written the majority of Federico Fellini's uh, movies that include Eight and a Half and La Dolce Vita, um, Knights of Cabiria. The beautiful score on this is by Georges Delarue, and he had done a lot of work with Francois Truffaut. And then one of the cast members also in this is Gunnel Lindblom, and she has done a lot of work with Ingmar Bergman. So really, really fascinating crew with this. This film is gorgeously shot in black and white by Marcel Grignon, and the dramatic camera work in this is absolutely sensational. It really does uh, convey pure cinema in terms of how the camera is used here to tell the story. Um, so yeah, this is a fantastic film that is definitely worth seeking out if you can find it. Now, in 1966, John Gilliman really started getting involved in some of the bigger technical stuff, and he was doing this World War drama, The Blue Max, uh, that stars George Peppard and James Mason and Ursula Andress. Um, so, yeah, this one involves uh, George Peppard as a, a pilot who has to prove himself in this. So, yeah, lots of big stirring action scenes in this and flying sequences. Quite a big technical achievement here for John Gilliman. And John Gilliman was on pretty good terms with George Peppard and worked with him again in this one, PJ, from 1968, uh, which has uh, George Peppard as a detective in this who gets framed for murder. This one also stars Gail Honeycutt and Raymond Burr. Um, it has an interesting fight sequence in a gay bar, and it also has cinematography from Loyal Griggs, uh, who worked on the classic Western Shane. And then again, he worked with George Peppard in House of Cards, also 1968, uh, another thriller um, with great location shooting in Paris and Rome. And this one also stars Inga Stevens and Orson Welles. And then in 1969, John Gilliman went big scale again for a World War II action adventure, The Bridge at Remagen, with a terrific cast this that's uh, got George Seagull, Ben Gazzara, Bradford Dillman and Robert Vaughan. Uh, yeah, for me, this was perhaps one of the first films that really got me uh, watching John Gilliman films. I loved this one as a child, The Bridge at Remagen. I've seen this many times. El Condor is an interesting but not entirely successful western that John Gilliman did uh, that has a fascinating cast that includes Jim Brown and Lee Van Cleef, Elisha Cook Jr. and Mariana Hill, uh, who is certainly memorable for doing a striptease in this. Um, now, the big set that they built for this movie ended up being used in other movies later on, such as Conan the Barbarian. Uh, but yeah, El Condor, interesting western, but not a great success. Now, when we get into the 70s, it's the decade of the disaster movie. But no, before he did The Towering Inferno, John Gilliman did this one, Skyjacked, in 1972, uh, which has got Charlton Heston as the pilot of an airliner here um, who is trying to protect his passengers from a deranged war vet who's on board, played by James Brolin. Now, in 1973, Gordon Parks had been involved in directing the great character Shaft in Shaft and Shaft's big score. But it was John Gilliman that was brought in to direct the third film, which was Shaft in Africa, still with Richard Roundtree and uh, Vonetta McGee is in this as well. Um, and this is a really terrific uh, film. And I'm such a shame that uh, Criterion didn't uh, put this on their set of Shaft films. But I guess they were really uh, trying to do more of a tribute to Gordon Parks. But 
nonetheless shaft in africa definitely deserves to be seen um it does have some sort of james bond style gadgets in this it's a different uh, departure i guess for the shaft character uh, but there's a lot of fun to be had watching this one and then in 1974 we get to one of the biggest films of john gilliman's career and that is of course the towering inferno um, this incendiary drama that's uh, got an all-star cast that includes fred astaire paul newman uh, Steve McQueen, William Holden, Faye Dunaway, uh, Richard Chamberlain, so many good cast names in this and really this was a huge box office hit and really one of the best regarded disaster films of the 70s. With that big box office success behind him, John Gilliman was then involved with another heavyweight producer, Dino De Laurentiis, and that was in 1976 film King Kong. Uh, this one certainly still has its fans and it has a lot of people that don't like it as well. Uh, for me, you have to think that this film was made in 1976. The next year was 1977 and Star Wars and... The effects in movies changed after that time so yes this is a man in a gorilla suit for lots of it but there's loads of technical stuff that's involved in this film as well and i really love the uh, sequences that involve huge uh, mechanical furry arms that come out and hold jessica lang as the character in this now jessica lang made her film debut in king kong um, there's loads of still impressive stuff about this film i really love actually the tv version that's included on this shout factory uh, blu-ray uh, the tv version was a three hour version and it really uh, neatly splits the film into hourly segments you have a an hour long um journey to skull island and then an hour on the island itself and the discovery of kong and then an hour of uh returning kong to the city and uh the uh rampage through the city that there is in uh the final part of the film so much to enjoy in king kong um so yeah this is a great film that actually just keeps on getting better and better it's not one to be laughed at at all there's so many good things that happen in this and then in 1978, and again working with a big cast, John Gilliman did the big budget version of Death on the Nile, the Agatha Christie adventure uh, that has Peter Ustinov as Hercule Poirot in this one. A huge cast that includes Betty Davis, Maggie Smith, David Niven, uh, Lois Childs, uh, lots of uh, great cast members in this, um, an Oscar winner for its costume design. And really, um, although Kenneth Branagh remade this film not too long ago, uh, he used lots of CGI in it. And really this one, again, just you go back to look at this and just see the glorious uh, locations that it was filmed on and that great, magnificent uh, riverboat. Um, so, yeah, this is a fun film to still watch even now. Now, when we get to the 80s and the final films of John Gilliman's career, um, these were films that weren't met with uh, much critical acclaim at all. And some of them are sort of, you know, rotten tomato scores and all that kind of thing. So uh, one of them is Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Uh, Sheena with uh, Tanya Roberts in the lead role here. Um, now, I don't think this film really deserves all the criticism that it does get. I mean, yeah, it's not a great film by any means, but uh, there's still a lot to enjoy here. Um, and uh, technically, it was quite a difficult shoot to actually use all the wildlife that they did in this. And uh, Tanya Roberts... A very physically demanding role that she had in this and uh, it helped that she had an affinity with wildlife so she was actually quite comfortable uh, working with a lot of these uh, wildlife animals um, so she does really well here all things considered um, it was a difficult shoot I think John Gilliman at the time his son got killed in a car accident so uh, his mental state during the production of this was not at its best by any means and so it's kind of a remarkable thing really that the film got finished at all um but yeah so like i say not a great film by any means but there are, there is definitely some fun to be had in watching sheena i actually quite like this film and then in 1986 despite king kong having died at the end of the movie in 1976 
uh, producer Dino De Laurentiis did want to try and see if he could make another King Kong movie. And so John Gilliman was brought back for King Kong Lives, uh, in which King Kong gets a heart transplant and meets up with another female uh, ape. Um, yeah, for sure, this one is heavily ridiculed. And again, we've got some very um, mixed practical effects here. Again, you've got a gorilla uh, man in a suit uh, doing that and some model work. Um, again, I actually quite like the model work and uh, I do get some fun out of watching this movie. Uh, but for sure, it's not a great movie by any means um, and uh, perhaps shouldn't have been made really. Uh, but nonetheless, um, here it is. King Kong Lives. Now, King Kong Lives really marked the end of uh, John Gilliman's uh, theatrical movies. Uh, but he did go on to make one final movie, which was for TV. And it was a Western again. And uh, it was called The Tracker uh, with Chris Christopherson. Um, and this is actually a pretty decent Western. It also co-stars Scott Wilson, a very reliable actor. Um, and he's the villain of the role here. Um, and other people that are in the cast here include Mark Moses. Uh, you might remember him as being the very ineffectual uh, platoon leader in Oliver Stone's platoon. Um, and similarly, he's quite sort of weak-willed in this film as well and has to sort of summon up courage in this. So, yeah, quite interesting use of his character, David Huddleston, in this as well. And a, a curious electronic score by Sylvester LeVay, who had done uh, the soundtrack for Sylvester Stallone's Cobra. Um, so, yeah, an interesting final film for uh, John Gilliman, a Western the tracker. Okay, so there we go. There are a few films in John Gilliman's career that I haven't mentioned. Uh, there's a few that I haven't been able to get my hands on. Uh, there's one film called Mr. Patman, uh, which was made in 1980 with James Coburn, um, and it only ever came out on VHS. Um, so yeah, that's never had a release at all. Um, but like I say, there you go. That's a bit of an overview of the career of uh, John Gilliman and the varied films that he did make throughout his career. Um, I certainly encourage any anyone to uh, seek out some of these films and explore more of his career don't just think of him as the director of King Kong and the Towering Inferno because like I say those films really were overshadowed by um, producers who had a very strong influence and effect over those films um, but yeah thanks very much for watching I hope to see you again let me know your comments on some of these films it would be interesting for me to know uh, if you have seen other films in John Gilliman's career other than the the big two that get talked about a lot. Okay, I hope to see you again. All the best to you. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.